This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Here is a little something to add to your summer, especially if you want to have a successful fall. Hunter Education. Hunter Training Officer Dan Wilson joins us to talk about the course, the when, the where, and the what you will learn. It's really a course that makes a lot of practical sense and makes you a better outdoorsman or outdoorswoman. Plus, Lee from Kentucky Field Magazine is by with details on another Kentucky Blue Water Trail. As we go inside outdoors this week on Kentucky Field Radio. Kentucky has some troubled water. Sailing in a sewer all the way. Boaters dumping waste overboard when no one's looking ruins the day for everyone, fish included. So use an approved dump station. Sailing in a sewer all the day. Dilution is not the solution. Use your holding tank wisely or hold it in. A message from your Kentucky wildlife and boating officers. I don't know what you mean by skipper. Skipper? Skipper. 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 Hey, skipper. What? Don't skip the life jackets. Life jackets. You're right. Thanks for the reminder. Water officers everywhere remind you, your life jackets got your back. And the backing of everyone that wants you to come home alive. So, skipper, don't skip the life jackets. A public service message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Hunter Education. Get it while it's hot. Trust me on this one. Summer is scooting right on by. Fall hunting seasons will be here before you know it. And if you need your Hunter Education certification, don't put it off. Get it now. Get it while it's hot. Get it during the summer. You'll be glad you did once a fall full of opening days approaches. Just what Hunter Education is and where it's offered, what it costs, the whole shooting match is why we are talking with a man who can answer these questions. Dan Wilson, Hunter Training Officer. That sounds very official. Tell me what it is you do. What I do is I'm in charge of coordinating the uh, Hunter Education Program for 41 counties within the state. Uh, I've got most of the northern part of the state, the central part, uh, the the Golden Triangle, if you will, the northern Kentucky, Lexington, Louisville area, and even down into E-Town and LaRue County. And what I do is uh, basically I I make sure that all of our volunteers have everything that they need to be successful to administer the Hunter Ed program throughout the state. That is a big force out there that teaches hunter education in this state. We'll talk about that okay. in this hour. Hunter education goes back to 1991 in Kentucky. Who are the people that it applies to if they're going to hunt? If you were born after 1 or 1st of January 1975, you shall have a hunter ed card. But what it what it states is that you have completed the certification course so that you are, in a sense, a, a safe hunter. You are a, cer- you are a certified safe hunter and shown that you can exhibit safe skills out in the field. Hunters in Kentucky are certainly aware of this. However, there are some people that you said 1975. If my math is close, that means you're going to be 38, 39 or so. If you're 40, this doesn't apply to you. If you're 37... It does apply to you. And so while you may think this isn't just for uh, new hunter, children, youth hunts, uh, this is for anyone uh, that could be even in their 30s that that this would apply to. Uh, What I've noticed within the classes that I've just taught, that I've been a part of and that I've observed, I've noticed that there is a a large group of uh, 30-somes, 40-somes, 50 sons, even 60 sons really? that attend. Yes. So that yeah. they don't have to take it, yet they do. They do. And I, I, I ask and inquire sometimes, and I hear from I hear a, a vast array of answers. I hear, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, I hear, I've never owned a gun before. I want to take a gun safety course. 
and that's totally fine. We encourage that. That's a good pl- a spot right there to transition into what a Hutter education course is. It's not a semester long. It's not two weeks long. No. How long is it? Well, th- that's the good thing with uh, having so many wonderful volunteers is some of our volunteers will have a one-day course, the the one-and-done course. And some of our, some Kentucky hunters love that course. They they love that, you know, they can only donate one day, or, if you will, donate one day of their time. And they come in there Saturdays, usually, at 8 o'clock in the morning. And by 4.30, 5 o'clock, you know, given a, given a 45 minute to an hour lunch break, they're done. They're, they're ready to go. But then again, there are some people that, uh, you know, they, they have to, they can't sacrifice that whole day. So they'll take a, what will we do? A uh, three day course where we do three different days from, say, uh, six until nine. And then on Saturday, it will, you'll, you'll do like a Thursday, Friday, and then on Saturday, you'll do the range portion, and then you're done. So it sounds like about eight or nine hours pushing it, you will have covered the course, and that is a classroom portion, which is, I guess, textbooks and a lecture, and then there's a range portion. Yes. Uh, I want to talk about both portions in depth a little bit. What most people get the most out of is hunter ethics. Hunter ethics. Yes. Explain that. Well, hunter ethics, what, what I mean by that is... Do you shoot, don't shoot? Uh, how do you approach landowners about if it's possible if you can use their property to hunt or not? Um, how you portray yourself as a hunter in the wild? Uh, and not only in the wild, but within society as well. Hunter ethics toward other hunters, toward landowners, toward wildlife, toward uh, non-hunters especially. When I do the class, I see a lot of heads tilt and a lot of light bulbs go on when... I say certain things about how hunters are portrayed and how their actions are portrayed in the actions of not only non-hunters, but anti-hunters, if that makes sense. I understand where you're going with that, and I guess it sort of depends on whose path you cross. I think I would appreciate that part of hunter ethics. Let's just take deer, for example. There are no mountain lions and wolves out there anymore, not in this state. People will not allow their existence in this state. But the hunter helps to step in and control those numbers. Otherwise, uh, deer are everywhere. Is that sort of the message you're sending in that portion of the course? Well, we we talk a lot about carrying capacity. You know, in, in this sense is what, what you're speaking of. You know, there's only so much resources that can s- sustain wildlife throughout the calendar year, throughout the 365 calendar year. So we definitely educate on how hunting impacts that positively. Portions of the Hunter Red course, we mentioned uh, gun safety, hunter ethics, there's wildlife identification. Yes. Give me the list and sort of the minute message of each portion of the course when you take it. Everybody that goes there will always remember the Alan Madison videos. And, you know, I'm sure I probably got a few laughs out of some people out there. But uh, the Alan Madison videos, even though, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen them or not, they're, they're dated, probably within the 70s. Yeah. And the thing is, I tell the students, if you were to put new cars in there and camo, there would be no difference. Because all the safety concepts and reasoning behind the methods, it's the same across time. So that, that's, that's where we transition into gun safety and hunter ethics, taking an ethical shot. Is it ethical to take this shot to this animal? Can I hit this animal? What's beyond the animal? Uh, what if I miss? What if the animal runs? You know, all the what ifs and calculating into that, you know, a red light or a green light for taking, taking the shot. The different types of firearms, how they work. Um, then you've got archery. And then you've got tree stand safety, wildlife identification. Dan Wilson, you've got a fall season of hunting seasons that are coming up. That It's going to be here before you know it. And you have a lot of people that are going to need this Hunter Ed Orange card to be legal in the field. Mm-hmm. And what we're talking about here, and we'll, we'll get into some of these seasons and what you're doing to accommodate 
The Rush. But at first I want to hit a little bit more about here's what you're going to be learning when you get there. So it you know, reminds me of college. Well, what's this trigonometry class all about? What is this statistics class all about? It's sort of scary when you don't know. Mm-hmm. But going into it, you may say, I already know a little about that. I know mm-hmm. a little about that. Mm-hmm. Well, I, yeah. Now you're going to go in and you're going to learn. You're going to sort of fill in some of those gaps. On that list, you had ethics, wildlife identification, firearms. In the next segment, Dan, I want to hear more about what Hunter Education teaches about all the various firearms you'll be using in the field. Stay with us. I'm Charlie Baglin. This is Kentucky Field Radio. It's Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. The topic today is Hunter Education. My guest is Dan Wilson, Hunter Education Training Officer. Dan is over the, let's call it the North Central Region of Kentucky. And when we left the last segment, Dan, we were talking about firearms. When you talk about firearms, are you covering just hunting rifles, a thirty out six, twenty twos? Do you cover muzzle loaders? We do. We do. We cover a whole gamut. Of, you know, the, and 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 I like to tell people that you know there are 20 different types of shovels out there and they all excel at doing one specific thing firearms are the same way it's you you wouldn't use a a a huge over you know a large caliber rifle to hunt rabbits with like a 30-06 or something like that that each one of them has their purpose and you know to go with the different seasons and to cover all the seasons equally because, as we know, there are some people out there that specifically hunt rabbit and squirrel. They don't really care too much for deer. They don't like the taste of it. So that they stick with uh, small game and fur bears. We try to cover not only rimfire ammunition, rimfire rifles, pistols, but we also try to cover centerfire rifles. We try to cover all the different types of actions. Lever action, bolt action, semi-auto, break action. And also, to take it a step further, uh, wing hunters. The, the waterfowlers, the dove hunters, uh, the upland hunters, people that do those types of sports with, within the state of Kentucky or outside of the state of Kentucky. We try to cover uh, being aware of your surroundings, who's to your left, who's to your right, never stepping in front, keeping that line intact. That's just one of the safety things that we stress when it comes to firearm handling. My father's father, my grandfather, whom I never met, he went through life without his right hand. From crossing a fence. From crossing a fence yes. with a loaded yes. firearm. Yes. But to take it another step further, my uncle had an accident where he shot himself in the foot from crossing a fence. And I tell my students this. When you cross a fence, you are taking your attention off that firearm, and you're putting your attention on crossing the fence. Unload, lay it on the ground, or hand it off to another hunter who has already crossed with an unloaded firearm, and then load, if necessary, to continue on. You can't be too safe. You cannot. And your grandfather is testament yes. to that. Yes, yes. I remember back when I was 14 that you can't tell me anything because I already know. Yeah. <laughs> and don't tell me how to cross fence. I know how to climb a fence. But I don't know how to climb a fence with a loaded fire or exactly. with a firearm. Exactly. Because the worst, it can come back to bite you. It, very, definitely. Now, a lot of what you're saying here, Dan, mm-hmm. is, of course, applicable to the field. But this will carry over to target shooters that will carry over mm-hmm. for home safety. Mm, definitely. With firearms. Definitely. We, uh, one of the tips that I use with uh, when I talk about firearms cleaning uh, making sure your firearm functions properly. There's been also some talk about certain types of firearms that go off without the trigger being touched or by take, simply taking the safety off. There's been talk about that, and we've you know there's there's individuals that have seen the the media special that's been put out, and we talk about that and we say well in this case with the firearm. Uh, commandments, if you will, up on up on the board, which rule was violated in this case? And you say, oh, well, the person should have known what was in front of and beyond their target, or their firearm was not pointed in a safe direction. They weren't paying attention to where their muzzle was pointed. The action was not open. Their finger was on the trigger without when, when they weren't 
intending to take game. So that's just one of the things that we also speak about. And one of the big tips is never use live ammunition inside a house. And, you know, some people will say, well, I, I, I want to know if I put my firearm back together right after I cleaned it. Well, when you buy that firearm, the, the chamber of the firearm typically doesn't change. Uh, there, you know, spend the extra five dollars and go get you some dummy rounds. Yeah, and that that saves that that answers that problem right there. Well, that's a lot of practical advice in a hunter education course that costs nothing. There yes. is no charge to that's take yes. hunter education courses. Yes. Want to talk more about the course itself with the onset? Of the fall hunting seasons, and buddy, there are a bunch, and I took a note here. Mm-hmm. You, have, you have, of course, dove opens up early September. Mm-hmm. There's a deer season for archery, mm-hmm. blue wing teal, wood duck, woodcock, take a breath. Yeah. Rail, gallinule, muir hen, snipe, sandhill crane, September Canada goose, and that only begins the list. Exactly. It's amazing. I'm sure uh, elk are in there if you were lucky enough to be drawn. Yes. It's busy, and there is a lot of attractants. There's a lot of reason to want to be hunting in the fall, come fall. Yes. But you need your orange card first. I hear a lot of individuals that contact me, and they say, well, you know, Johnny's got baseball practice on Tuesday. He's got track practice on Wednesday. He's got uh, football practice on Thursday. And... Nobody wants to do anything on Friday night but relax. And Saturday, he's got a t-ball game. Or, you know, you know the ske- people are busy these days, yeah. and I understand that. I'm, I'm definitely one of them. So you need to plan ahead a little bit, and this oh, yes. is part of it. It is. And, and that's another thing that I like to tell people is that pulling the trigger is such a small portion of the hunting experience. The, the scouting of the game, finding the location, scent management, uh, your method of take. And I also talk to a lot of people who say, hey, I'm going to hunt elk in Colorado. I'm going on the hunt of a lifetime. Or I'm going to Alaska. Or I'm going to Africa. They come to the course because not only is it required within the state of Kentucky, it's required and transferable to different states because we are all under the IHEA content, International Hunter Education Association. It's it's the same standard across the board. Every state has it. That's a good point, because in the event that you think this is a Kentucky-only deal, and you may be looking for a way to get out of it, uh, it ain't one, yeah. uh, necessarily. Yes. And if you want to go to Indiana and hunt instead, or Tennessee, or any adjoining states, or anywhere else in the Union, you're going to need to show that you've undergone this this course training. Yes. Yes. And, and, and that's another thing that we, we also stress, is... We show a picture of the hunting guide. It says at the bottom, bottom line is it's your responsibility. And not only within the state of Kentucky to, to know the laws, guidelines, rules, and regulations, but if you're going to Indiana, the excuse of, well, this is the way it is in Kentucky, doesn't fly. Every state is different. And, it, and it's all in tune to their wildlife seasonal needs, their carrying capacity, what's doing well in their state, and what what needs a little more assistance. So that's another big point to drive home to people, that do do your homework. So back to this planning ahead. Mm -hmm. Here we are looking, I mean, looking September in the Mm -hmm. face. It's getting close. I've heard it said, hunter education, get it while it's hot. Mm. And that is if you are on your summer school break, Mm -hmm. and I guess I'm talking to a student, grades, you know, whatever it would be up through high uh-huh, school, and yep. you're, you're between uh, maybe for college, mm-hmm. and get it while you're off school in the summer, get it while it's hot, mm-hmm. because come fall, when you want to hunt, uh, then you're going to be scrambling, mm-hmm. and so we have these options for getting it, and, and do these classes increase in number as fall nears, or are there other options that you can do in lieu of the classroom? There are. There, there are alternative methods, and I'll break this down into two different portions. Uh, the classroom, from what I understand and what I've, what I've experienced, is that the closer to a season opening that you get, the more your class load is going to be. 
the more uh, students you're going to have in your class. The re- you know the reason that is is as you've said, people don't think about it until it comes around, and then you know they scramble. And not only that is is we get a phone call and email. I haven't got my card yet, sir. It's been two weeks. I haven't got my card yet. Well, when when the load increases, you know, the mail room gets backed up, the uh, the printing system gets backed up, and whatnot, and that that just that's part of it. But the getting it while it's hot is an am- it's an amazing thing to remember, uh, because if you do the if you do this now, and honestly, if you do this two week if you did this two weeks ago. It's just one less step that you're going to have to worry about. And it's not like hunting is something you hunting is not something you decide to do at the spur of the moment. There is planning you have to do, readying yourself and your equipment and permission and knowing where to go and scout the area in advance. Yes. And it takes a while. And that's all you need is one more thing to do. And, of course, then you've got your life to live. You've got mm-hmm. classes that you're already in in school or a job mm-hmm. you're working or kids you're taking care of. Mm-hmm. That's well, all you need is one more thing. Yes. And if you get this done now... I know there's options for videotape and VCR and blah, blah, blah on the Internet. Mm-hmm. But for the classroom, do these classes fill up? Uh, well, you know, I, I've done classes that have as many as, not, as, I'm sorry, as few as nine, but as many as 130. So they're not going to fill up. Uh, it, it, you just never know. Dan, we got to get to a break. In the next segment, I want to hear more about alternative methods to the classroom portion. I'm Charlie Baglin. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. Charlie Baglin back on Kentucky Afield Radio. Sometimes it's the little things we do for conservation that make a difference, such as the license plate we put on our car or truck. There was a new one. It features the world record smallmouth bass caught in Kentucky back in 1955 on Dale Hollow Lake. Each plate sold supports the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Foundation, an organization which supports youth conservation programs all across the Commonwealth, such as scholarships to attend conservation camps and the Salado Wildlife Education Center and others. You can learn more at KentuckyWildlife.com. And speaking of fish, it is time now for our fishing report. Hi, this is Eric Cummins with Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barren River Lake bass fishing is fair early and late on top waters. Catch fishing has been excellent. Jugs, Green River Lake bass is fair early and late top waters again. Texas rig, lizards, and big worms. Crappie fishing has been fair, about 15 to 18 foot of water. Likewise, channel cat fishing has been good hook and line, and also jug fishing with cut bait or livers. Musky fishing has been good in the back end with Peter Creek. That's uh, at the advantage of that cooler water coming in. Cumberland River, very good for trout and stripers. Striper action best around the Thurksville area and downstream. As always, good luck and good fishing. Be sure you wear your life jacket. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. We're currently in the dog days of summer. However, black bass fishermen are catching a few bass. Early in the morning and late in the evenings, uh, use on top waters such as buzz baits or stick baits. But as well, they're catching a few on soft plastics fished around shoreline cover. Also, several fish are being caught during nighttime hours uh, under a black light uh, using soft plastics around shoreline cover. Catfish anglers are catching a few blue and chow catfish at Taylorsville Lake, fishing cut shad at 6 to 14 feet of water. Fish the creek or river channel edges uh, to catch a few of these fish. And finally, many of our fishing and neighborhood program lakes have recently been stocked with channel catfish. So good luck. Hope to see you on the water. This is Neil Jackson, your Western District Fisheries Biologist, with your fishing report. Our fishing in Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley is tied closely with water flows during the summer months. As the Corps of Engineers and TVA increase flows in the afternoon and evening to meet the energy demand of buzzing air conditioners, largemouth bass and blue catfish patterns become more predictable on the ledges of the main lakes. Despite cooler temperatures this week, summer patterns for channel catfish in the Kentucky tailwaters are in full effect. Try cheese bait around bridge piers and woody habitat near the banks. 
Bluegill are elusive this time of year, but hardcore anglers are searching for them with light drop shots in deeper water near secondary points and ledges. Finally, beat the summer heat by fishing for rainbow trout in western Kentucky's only trout stream. Try spinners or beadhead woolly buggers for Casey Creek trout. As always, have fun and be safe on the water. Hunter education, get it while it's hot. More on the subject after the break. In a unit, many function as one. What's the policy on your boat? Michael Noss, Navy SEAL. Your attitude toward wearing a life jacket, even if you know how to swim, will prompt others to do the same. Be alert, be a leader. Injury, choking, and worse can happen when a wave sends you and your craft in opposite directions. And just hope your life jacket isn't missing in action. That's training you can trust. Kentucky Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jacket's got your back and the backing of the best swimmers everywhere. This is Charlie Baglin back on Kentucky Field Radio, and Dan Wilson, Hunter Training Officer, is my guest, talking about ways to get your Hunter Education Orange Card and not have to physically attend the classroom portion. There are choices. There's been a big push recently because, you know, as I was saying earlier, we lead very busy lifestyles with uh, athletics, uh, education, extracurricular activities. People, some individuals don't have time to even give a Saturday. Well, the good thing is, is that you can go online. Uh, the online version does cost. There's a cost to it. And what that does is that gives you the standard online. And you can come and go from it. You don't have to sit down and complete it. There's also uh, CD-ROMs that are available. You insert in your computer, you know, kind of a plug-and-play thing. And they, they sit down, they take the course, they take the test, and then they come do the range portion, and they're done. So there is a test to that classroom part, even though it may be online yes. or on a CD. Yes. And where is that, again, where do you take that test for the classroom portion? Well, if you go to a classroom, you take the test prior to the range. But if you do an alternative methods, you take the test, and as soon as you reach a passing score, it prints you out a certificate of completion. And then you bring that certificate of completion to the range day. You take the range portion... And then your card comes in the mail. But you still have to do the test online, and it's not one of these gimmies. Oh, you no. You still have to pass it. Yes. there's, And, and you know, the, the test that, you give, that you're given online and the test that you give in the class, there may be a, a question worded a little bit different here and there, but the standard is the standard nonetheless. We want people to be safe because we care for not only the safety of the hunter in general, but also other individuals out there. The... Alternative methods, the advantage to that is if you didn't quite get a concept, you can always go back and go over the topic again. And then you can, you can understand it. You, 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 you're not nailed down to only hearing it once. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yes. So, yeah, that's good. So I, yeah, I may opt for one of those, but I'm glad those choices are there. Yes. So, again, you have classroom, you have online mm -hmm. and you have a DVD version of this CD? Yeah, it's it's a CD, yes. Yes. And that takes care of the classroom portion that we've talked about uh -huh. now extensively. There is a range portion. What's yes. that about? How long does that take? And what do you need to bring with you? Well, the range portion, uh you don't need to bring anything. Uh, we get we have a common question of may I bring my own firearm? I'm familiar with it. We don't do that because some individuals, you know, even though their firearm may be great, uh, other individuals may bring one that has somewhat fallen into disrepair. And also for the manner of consistency, we, we provide the firearms, we provide the ammunition, uh, we provide the bow, we provide the arrows. Uh, we also, at some courses, we do provide black powder uh, ammunition as well. So the range portion, when you show up, you will actually be shooting, mm -hmm. and you'll show a proper use of the firearm. That's what we're looking for, safety over success. I tell my students that. So you don't have to hit the target. No, <laughs> no. That's, that's something, those skills, that skill set can be learned over time. I've run into people that when they pick up the firearm, they're shaking. Pick up the firearm, you know, I walk them through it, you know, pull the hammer back, squeeze the trigger, you know, snap, it goes off. And we also incorporate instruction. It's not just here's a firearm, 
shoot some. We don't care if you miss or not. All we're looking for is that you know how to use the safety. We also incorporate training into that where, you know, you have trigger control, sight alignment, breathing, target acquisition, looking through the sights, making sure your sight alignment's correct. And we go through those methods so that if people have never shot before, they have a foot in the door, so to speak. They know where to build when they go to their shooting range or when they when they go to their, their aunt, uncle, dad, mom, brother, sister's farm and, and target practice, which is another portion of our class, Practice Makes Perfect. And how long does this take? Let's say you do the field portion on, let's just say it happens to fall on a Saturday morning. How long should a person plan? Really, you know, if you a lot the time say, I've got this whole day, I'm going to be dedicated to this, I want to know, I'm, I'm here to learn. That's what we hope for. And you may get lucky. And everything goes well, weather cooperates, exactly. and you're out a little early. Exactly. Then you've got the then you got the rest of the day to go pick up some shells or something like that. And and I, I hear that a lot too. I'm I'm going to shoot this afternoon. Generally from your first time shooters. Archery has been mentioned, although not really dwelled upon. And a bow hunter education course mm-hmm. is a substitute for hunter education in some circumstances. Explain what that is. Well, bow hunter education. You know, as the name states, is strictly for bow hunters. That transfers over, and you also learn the skills. You know, with archery, you know, the key being shot placement. If uh, if you cannot reliably and consistently hit your target, then that's that's another thing to focus on. And and another good thing about archers, some cities out there have ordinances against it. But a lot of cities don't. It's something you can practice within city limits. The good thing that I see is really looking at it from a seasonal perspective is you get the first crack at it. So, you know, when archery season opens up, it's before muzzleloader and it's before modern gun. So you get the first shot and the last shot, if you will, because depending on your zone, it lasts further than modern gun and muzzleloading season. So, and then you've, of course, got your uh, archers who prefer crossbow, which uh, even then, you know, you've got some uh, some of them that will shoot either, but then you have some of them that swear by a crossbow and won't pick up a bow. I'm guessing that if you shoot the National Archery in the Schools program, if you're a NASP student, that may apply to you. If you are in the Explore Bow Hunting program, anywhere they are taught across this uh, state mm-hmm. of ours, that'd be a natural draw for you. You mm-hmm. already got the knack, and you probably already have the target set up in the backyard to practice. Exactly. You know, in my courses, I find a lot of kids that uh, I can tell. I don't even have to ask them. Uh, you know, with volunteering at the NASP program, uh, I've, I've done the, the state tournament twice in the national tournament one time I've been at it and assisted I can tell when a youth picks up a bow I can tell by their stance they have the the same anchor point the way they sight and even their consistency in group shots I can tell the success of the NAS program has helped to integrate these kids into future hunters that you know they're they're not necessarily you know picking up a bow doesn't mean that you're going to be a hunter but it sure gives you a base of knowledge and a skill set to be an effective archer. Absolutely. That's quite the feather in the cap. The hunter education in Kentucky is taught and implemented by volunteers. Yes. That's impressive. How big is that army of instructors? Well, it changes a lot. Within my region that I have, I think it, the last time I was told it was around 300 within the region. But it's well over a thousand oh, that my. I know that people that individuals that volunteer their time. That many people, a thousand. Yes. Holy smoke! Where do you find volunteers that would want to do this? They come to us, definitely. So there's never a shortage. Never. People want to share what they love. Yes. It's sim- as simple as that. Yes. They want to pass it on. They definitely want to pass on those skills. the The good thing is is that you know whenever I do a class I have a slide in my slideshow that says are you inter- you know are you interested in this if you'd like to do this contact us it seems like every class there's at least someone that says I would love to do this I would love to help out if you know if there are any of my volunteer instructors out there listening I I have to give a thank you because 
as I said, my job is to just make sure is to make sure that they are successful, that they have what they need, that they have the equipment necessary. Uh, if there are any hurdles to uh, securing a range or getting someone to grant them use of a facility, uh, I, I may call and say, you know, this is what this is for. Because you know when when you when you have someone that confronts you and says that I'm a volunteer instructor, not everybody knows about our program. I can call them and I can say you know this individual is they're volunteering their time, and that's another thing that uh, we've come into a lot is a lot of people would like to charge for use of facilities, and and I say to them you know this is all done on a volunteer basis. Nobody here takes a dime. We don't charge a dime for these classes. But then again, there are a lot of instructors who teach you know. The course at the uh, Owen County Library, the second Saturday of every May. You know what I mean? You can just count on it. There's going to be one there. And every, that word gets out. There's instructors that have been instructing for the department on a volunteer basis probably just about as long, if not longer, than I've been alive. Hmm. I'm very thankful to that. And that, that is, that's sacrifice. That's, uh, that's courage to stand up and do what's right, to pass the sport on, because if that is not done then that paints a gloomy picture for the future. Somebody listening is saying, I could do that. I could do that two or three times, four times, once a month, whatever. I could do that. And so they could contact you or any Hunter Education across the state. They could call the office at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. They can. And I guess you could go online and find out a little more of what's expected. If you go to our website, fw.ky dot g o v and if you click on uh, education and you click on hunter education there's all kinds of information there about the hunter ed program and there's also information on how to become a volunteer instructor you can call me if by clicking on the uh the hunter ed regions there's three of us uh, i'll be glad to talk to you and i'll be glad to set you up with will or bobby if if you're not within my county because we definitely welcome the help this, we understand that it's volunteer, and we're not asking that you teach 20 classes a year because we know that that leads, leads to burnout. And we, we want to keep you around for as long as you'd like to stay. A class or two a year within your home county, that would be greatly appreciated. Dan Wilson, Hunter Training Officer of Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, I certainly appreciate what you do and what uh, the volunteer staff does and the, the fact that you exist to make hunting safer, more enjoyable across the Commonwealth. Uh, my hat's off to you, dude. Thank you. Last question that I always ask, do you text and drive? I do not. I, I will definitely pull over, but I will not text and drive. Dan, thanks a million. Thank you. More to come. This is Kentucky Field Radio. We are back on Kentucky Field Radio, and in the studio with me is writer from Kentucky Field Magazine is Lee McClellan. Lee, I, I saw a press release from you this summer talking about another Blue Water Trail in your series. How many does that make now? 22. 22? Mm-hmm. What's the minute definition of a Blue Water Trail? It's a series that promotes fishing and paddling opportunities on our abundant streams and rivers here in Kentucky. We were blessed here. We have a tremendous amount of flowing water in our state. Um, a lot of our streams, are, such as the Green River, have some of the highest water quality, not only in the United States, but in the world. Um, the Green River is an ecological uh, marvel. It's a biological treasure. It holds species that are only found in the Green River system. Uh, there are species that have declined and, and have been what the biologists call extirpated from areas that still live in the Green River, and they may be the only place on Earth they're still found. And these creatures are mussels? Mainly mussels, yes. And those are the freshwater clams, look at the ash trays, if you will, that you see in the bottom of yep. dry stream breads anyway. Yes. But those do a significant role in water purification. And, yes, they do. And water quality. So, yes, yeah, the green do. thumbs up to the Green River. Yeah, it's wonderful. I, I printed off your press release, and... It's mostly highlighter orange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's in Hart County. Yes. And you say, already said, most biological diverse. I could have saved that ink. Three float trips in this part of the river. Mm -hmm. So describe each one of those. Well, one is uh, the, the Lynn Camp Creek 
gives you a chance to um, to experience the prettiest part of the float. However, there's a an outfitter in town, um, uh, Big Buffalo Crossing, that you'll need to coordinate with to use this first access. Um, it's not public. I think it was one of those spots that people used for a long time, but uh, I just visited very recently, and it's posted. And you, one of the things that we must do when we're using our streams is to respect the landowners that live along the stream. They tolerate your boating. They tolerate you coming through. You own the water, but they own the land. Right. And um, uh, we need to respect them. Um, the second float is at one of our VPA sites to a, and then to a, uh, a, a little park. Um, and it's a beautiful float. It goes through some very historic country. Um, really good fishing through that series. And then another one that's an easy half day float. Com- uh, you, you can make a very interesting day if you're, if you're intrepid. There's a beautiful, it's called the, uh, uh, Jenny, uh, Wilson Bird Memorial Trail. And it's four and a half miles. It leads from, uh, Thelma Stovall Park in downtown Munfordville right on the river. It's also known as Green River Park. And then you go out to Harry Wilson Park, upstream four and a half miles. Some people will arrange with the friend or with the uh, canoe service. They can hike up in the morning, get in the canoe, and float back. That works. That, I mean, that'd be great. And so you get a day, you get a half day of floating, you get a half day hike, and you can just experience it. It's a very unique thing you can do. Now, the water along the Green River, this is all what I'll just call slack water. What are the riffles like? Um, they're gentle, but this section of the Green, I think a lot of people... Um, go to Mammoth Cave, and they see that, and I've done a Blue Water Trail on that section as well, and they see the impounded water from Lock and Dam 6 there at uh, Brownsville. And um, they they assume the whole river's like that. This is pool. These are long pools, but a lot of really uh, long shoal areas that are not over your head deep that have good flow. Years ago, I went with uh, Leroy Coke of the Fish and Wildlife Service and our guy, Monty McGregor, and who are both uh, what are known as malacologists, mussel uh, uh, um, biologists, and we looked for the ring pink mussel along this stretch. And I really surveyed a lot and weighted a lot of it, and, and it's just beautiful, great water. It's not like Kentucky River or anything. I mean, it has good flow to it most of the time. The riffles on it are gentle. They give you enough. Uh, they'll enliven the paddling, but they're very easy for people to handle. Two things I saw pointed out in this. Well, one was a waterfall. With 300 springs. Uh, it's like, uh, and, and sometimes they're, they're flowing great, sometimes not so much. Um it comes out of the side of a bluff there, right in the first float, about uh, two and a half, three miles into it. And it looks like waterfalls are coming out of the side of the bluff through bushes. It's one of the most unique spots. Um, I know uh, there's been some documentaries done on it, and one of those Kentucky's last great places, they visited them with a guy from the Nature Conservancy. They're, they're really, really neat. And um, that's an excellent little stop on, on that first float. You mentioned the Civil War in this, Andrew mm-hmm. Jackson. This looks like a pretty good place for history beyond just yes, fishing and Yes, you, you could combine a day. There was a battle, uh, very important. The l and Railroad crosses there, the Green River, at Munfordville, and it was incredibly strategic for both sides. Um, of course, the South wanted to control it so they could uh, blunt Union penetration into the Upper South. The Union wanted to control it because that gave them access right into the interior of, of the Confederacy, right to Nashville. So whoever held that vital junction was in a very commanding position to control not only that part of Kentucky, but the entrance into Tennessee. There was a battle fought there that eventually, uh, it's funny, the Confederates won the battle through overwhelming force, but soon as a prelude to Perryville, they abandoned the position, the Union reoccupied it, and kept it for the rest of the war. There was also Kentucky's first gunpowder mill on Lynn Cant Creek, and some of the gunpowder mine there was used by Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans and, and during the War of 1812 and his victory over the British. So it's you, you, can, you can hike. You can go. There's a uh, Battle of the Bridges Memorial Park. They've preserved it. You've got interpretive trails. You can go do a cell phone walking tour downtown in Mumfordville and visit all their historic sites. There's some wonderful restaurants. You can go hiking, then you can float, catch small mouse, uh, canoe, kayak, paddle, have a great time. So you can com- have a whole weekend of, of history, hiking, paddling. And some muscalunge in that stretch, too. <laughs> Where can folks find out a little bit more about it? Go to fw.ky.gov. Right now, it's in the middle under the news releases section. 
Also, you can go to uh, the Fishing and Boating tab. There's a Blue Water Trails tab on there. You hit that. There's a printable map that's usable and the narrative that goes along with the piece. And you can read everything that Lee has to say. You really painted quite the lovely picture of this part of our state. Well, I appreciate uh, it. In words. And I, I really enjoyed it. Well, I, I gave you a call, and I'm glad you could stop out. All right. Well, I, I enjoy doing them, and uh, we're going to continue uh, look for some more this summer. I think we're going to do one on Barron River, below Barron River Lake Dam, the Drake's Creek system, uh, probably another one on the Kentucky River. Uh, look for some more. We're going to be cranking out several more again this year. I always have a question I ask guess before we close the show do you text and drive uh, i do not do you text and fish i talk on my phone i don't type on it lee mcclellan kentucky field magazine we are out of time come back again in one week we will go inside outdoors again right here on kentucky field radio